Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Audrey. It's a, a great privilege and pleasure to be sponsoring the, Alp Com the Alps Conference this year. Um, I've got the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker this morning, Quanshan Wang, I hope I've got that right, <laughs> um, who I think promises to give us a fascinating insight into um, the sort of research that's going on behind the scenes and that will be quite transformative to our lives. Um, Huan Shan is uh, an electrical engineer by background with degrees, a glittering array of degrees from the National Taiwan University and the University of Maryland and a PhD also from Maryland. Um, during his impressive career at Microsoft, he's been doing a lot of research into speech technologies and he's actually played a a lead role in developing some very, very major breakthroughs for, for Microsoft, um, and particularly Microsoft Speech Server, which powers um, their corporate call center, the Microsoft Response Point, which is about speech -enabled, a speech-enabled phone system using voice over internet protocol, something I know we've just introduced in our new offices back at base. Um, and the Microsoft Web Engram, which powers something he calls cute demo, like um, word breaker for web. He's currently conducting research into um, web search, large scale data mining, dialogue systems, and web scale natural language processing. And what he's going to do is tell us about the research that is underway, uh, which is transforming the web from being merely um, reactionary to our needs into something that really pushes things out towards us as and when we need them. So becoming a bit more um, human, as it were, not quite, but um, certainly evolving from just being a sort of uh, very um, document-based sort of facility. So without further ado, I think um, we're going to have a very interesting talk this morning and I'm delighted to introduce Kwan Sum. Well, thank you, Sarah, for the uh, kind introduction. And it is my greatest pleasure to be here today. Uh, standing in front of you, I realize that I actually have two distinct roles. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, I'm still an active researcher, writing, reading, and reviewing papers. So uh, in, in, in many ways, I'm a, actually a customer of the product and services that many of you are developing. Uh, last night, we heard all these many uh, these, uh, finalist uh, products. I like every one of them. Uh, so uh, I'm actually your customer. So that's one, uh, one role that I'm speaking uh, from today. And another role uh, is actually for, as a director of a, a research center in some Microsoft research. Um, in my pre previous, in, in historically, uh, we have been contributing actively to developing international standards in web technology area in W3C, ECMA, and ISO. And recently, uh, my group has taken over uh, what we call Microsoft Academic Search. And we have been uh, retooled it a little bit and in a way that we try to convert it into a platform. So in that regard, we hope to sign all of you as a, a potential customers of ours. So with these two roles in mind, uh, let me, uh, it's actually uh, very nice to be here to share with you what we are doing uh, at Microsoft Research and explain to you what, uh, the, uh, the thinking behind it. And so let me start it by defining what I meant by web and knowledge web. Uh, it's a terminology I just invented. Uh, so, so web uh, as is actually celebrating, as we know today, uh, is actually celebrating 25th anniversary this year. Uh, there's quite a few uh, activities on the web, uh, web25.org, uh, to celebrate the, uh, the, the seminal memos that Sir T uh, Tim Berners-Lee wrote uh, in November 1990, almost 25 years ago, in which he described a tiny uh, a, a side project uh, of his uh, in developing something called hypertext projects. And hypertext, of course, uh, is not a new idea. In fact, it 
it's dated back all the way to the end of World War II in this, um, uh, in this um, writing, uh, in this publication called As We May Think by Venar Bush, in which uh, Mr. Bush described a ideal publication, uh, which the, the, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a uh, dead text printed on the, on the paper, but it's actually alive in a way, in a way that uh, you can actually follow all the references uh, in, in instantaneously. So no longer you are going to the library, uh, the searching for the index cards, finding the call numbers, going to travel to the shelf, retrieve what you want. Uh, in it, it actually described how such an, uh, an automatic mechanism to fetch the information you want in a very automatic way. Uh, so in, a, in, in addition to the web, uh, to realizing that hypertext uh, technology dream, uh, Tim Berners-Lee actually had a second uh, proposal, uh, which is called Semantic Web uh, in 2000. Uh, so if you think about web, is a gigantic li library of the future. Semantic Web initiative was actually a, a, as a librarian, if you want, of the future, because the central theme of the development is actually uh, to build an intelligent agent that can serve and interact uh, with users uh, in a very um, natural way. Right, so in there, uh, so this is a, uh, in, the, in the archive of W3C uh, that described the original vision of semantic web. Uh, many of the uh, technology and uh, technology proposal have come to pass, and so we, we know the Unicode, URI, the, the, they are everywhere, and adopted uh, as a standards in our daily lives. XML uh, and schema, uh, XM, XML schema, uh, it's also everywhere. Uh, on top of, a uh, part of this uh, semantic web technology, it's actually, it actually includes a call, call of action to many of you as a publisher, uh, in addition to publish human readable content, the semantic web actually is a, uh, a initiative to, in, to invite publishers to publishing semantic content, namely the machine readable uh, form, in, a, uh, in the machine readable format, so that the computers can actually read them and uh, make the inference on top of that. And so, uh, you know, the, uh, if you remember from 10 years ago, there was quite a, uh, uh, a lot of activities uh, surrounding uh, what we call resource definition framework uh, for that and the, uh, to in many areas, specialized area, there were, there were actually standardization efforts surrounding ontology development. Um, 10 years after, uh, so the, uh, the, the adoption of RDF uh, are actually quite nice in many areas, but in other areas that are actually not as active as what it should be. And in, the, uh, in December uh, 2013, uh, that ac activity in W3C at least has been subsumed into another activity called W3C data. Uh, so Microsoft has been a participant uh, in many of the W3C uh, activities, and we are also a active uh, observer for this semantic web. Uh, and we, on the site, we learned a lot of lessons through the semantic web technologies. And as a researcher, we start thinking about, are there any things that we can do uh, to actually achieve the same vision uh, in a, a more natural and actually low-cost low way? And that is the uh, thinking behind what I call knowledge web. Uh, so if you look at the, uh, the central theme of semantic web, it's trying to help machine to understand contents uh, in using the uh, machine readable format. Uh, but uh, this is year 2015. Uh, thanks to the advancement of cloud computing uh, and many, uh, and also natural language processing, it is, uh, we are actually on the verge uh, of an era that machine can actually read human readable contents. So in many cases, uh, if we don't, uh, so the, uh, in many cases, if we don't have to publish machine readable format, it's not the end of the, it's not the end of the world. We actually have a, we are actually 
it is actually possible today. Uh, it's no longer a pipe dream that we can actually train the machine to read human readable format. And I would like to show some example of you what we have, what we're doing at Microsoft today. And the second one, second aspect of the semantic web uh, is because we need to, uh, yeah, to have a human uh, machine readable content. So we need humans to define standard on the data formats and the models, how the data is, are the, how the data are models. And my background uh, in the natural language processing and speech processing tells me that if you have two annotators in the room, chances are they are they, the, the agreements of what, how they actually define how things are modeled and how, how natural language sentences should be annotated uh, is not high. <laughs> and a joke uh, in our community is you get five people in a room to agree on, to, to come up with standards, you get six proposals. Uh, so <laughs> and so uh, this is just the uh, reality of life. So in many cases, uh, even human cannot agree on how we actually model the world. What, what, uh, what should we do? Why don't we, uh, so our, the question we are asking is, well, can we ask a machine to learn something on its own based on what it, what, what it needs? And so that's the, uh, that, that's the, uh, the idea of the knowledge web. Let's train the machine to learn what it needs, just like we all learned what uh, our model framework and things like that. It is possible. So finally, the third one uh, is because we need to have a standard, so human uh, have to explicitly define the precise definition of knowledge and knowledge representation, and they have all to be agreed upon. My 10 years with W3C and ISO tells me that you can try very hard to be very precise, inspect out what it is being, uh, what, what your intentions are, are, but I never, uh, the, the human creativities never cease to amaze me. Uh, even though you said these texts are supposed to be used in this format, chances are they are being used in a very creative way that beyond your original expectations. So to process those, uh, tags and schemas, you almost need to train your machine to be very resilient to different interpretations, alternative presentations, and in a sense, you, need, you want your process to be intelligent. So we might as well uh, design the intelligent processor from day one. Is it possible? So these are the research questions that we, we were asking under what I call knowledge web. And in, in many ways, uh, that the, uh, in one area uh, that I conduct research in the web search, uh, this has been actually, the industry has moved in a very uh, significant way. So if we com compare the traditional web search, uh, it's indexing keywords in the documents. Uh, when you have a query, then we match the keywords in your query uh, to the documents. And as some uh, alluded yesterday, if you don't find the web search results, it's the user, you have, a find, you have a come up with the right keywords. Uh, that's not, actually not very nice. Uh, and many ways, the, the way we use um, search engines today, uh, it's basically looking at the 10 blue links, the one, result, uh, one page, and if you don't see what you want, uh, you move on to the next query. So the search engines in, uh, in the industry uh, traditionally uh, has been evaluated by the so-called relevance of 10 blue links. Uh, in the knowledge web, though, we started, communic uh, we started working with our peers uh, in the industry, uh, notably from Google Research Labs and Baidu, to think about in the world of a knowledge web, how the search experience should be. Uh, and so what we would like to uh, jointly evolve, the search technology and the discovery in the uh, terminology in this community, is that instead of just indexing the keywords in the document, can we train the search engine or the, intel the artificial intelligence in the search engine to actually digest the knowledge, not just the keyword? Uh, because we all know that a lot of words have many different semantic meanings in different contexts, and many knowledge uh, are actually have to be aggregated to see the full context. So can we actually, instead of uh, uh, indexing keywords, we index the knowledge in the world? And then when users come, uh, they, they issue the query, 
can we actually read between the lines or going beyond the lexical to understand what they want, to match their intent to the knowledge instead of just literally take what they write uh, and match it into some keyword. Uh, so that's the matching the intent part. In many ways, in, ma in many, uh, more often than not, uh, that this matching process cannot be done in single exchange. Uh, so it probably, uh, as we go to the library and interact with the librarians, typically librarians would ask questions and we are having a good conversation. And so the, uh, the search engine probably should not uh, behave in a way that is a single term, give me a query, give you 10 results, you're done. Maybe we should actually, the, we should design a search engine that have a conversation, that can have a dialogue uh, with the user to understand what they want and then serve the right content. And so this is what we uh, think in the industry that the discovery uh, experience should be. And as you can see, they, uh, there are many efforts, not just Microsoft, uh, that has been uh, quite active uh, in this area. So the, uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to show you what we are doing at Microsoft, and specifically our search engine is Bing, and another part is for Cortana. I'll give you more, more details. But in the, uh, uh, in the dialogue uh, research community, we use the uh, jargon called Dialogue X. That's basically uh, a categories of uh, actions that the uh, machine intelligence uh, can infer in, in terms of uh, what to, in de uh, to determine what is the right responses to generate to, uh, to the user when they, the, when they see the query. So here are the, uh, in terms of uh, uh, confidence when you see a query, when, you, when a machine sees a query, uh, if you are very confident they can answer the question, they should just answer it. And sometimes less confident you can answer it, but you want to do some confirmation uh, if it is really confusing, you want to disambiguate with the users instead of just presumptu presumptuous create, uh, create presenting some an uh, answers. And finally, machine at this point can usually read more than we can read. Uh, so, and they can actually see more than uh, what we can see, how others are using a search engine. So actually machine has more knowledge than a lot of humans, so they should actually do some suggestion for us to make our life easier. And there are two types of suggestion. Uh, one is proact uh, the uh, progressive, to continue uh, what the user wants. And that what, that's what we call refinement. And or it can be digressive. Uh, you don't want to go for, to this route because it's, it's a dead end. Why don't I su suggest you to go the other way? Maybe you can have a more fruitful discovery. And that's what we call uh, recommendation. So let me give you some examples uh, so this is an example at Bing. Uh, you're welcome to try it today. Uh, the query is Jackie Chan action movie with some typo on it. And this is what the modern web search engine looked like, uh, both in Microsoft or in Google. You see it's not longer just 10 blue link. It's not, it, on, on the top of it, the uh, Jackie Chan action movies, we actually find all the movies and display it as a film strip, like Netflix. Uh, and to tell you right there in the uh, as answer. But because the original query uh, has some typos, so we actually confirm that we, we actually re, uh, correct the, the typo, and uh, but this kind of a correction behind the user, uh, behind user's back, you probably want to confirm uh, whether you're doing the right thing or not. And also, Jackie Chan, we also want to, we, you, the, uh, we want to show you that we interpret your Jackie Chan as this person, and so it's actually, uh, we try to, uh, it, it's actually nice to confirm with you that this is indeed the Jackie Chan you want. By seeing a lot of people asking for Jackie Chan related query, uh, we see in addition, a lot of time people also are interested in the uh, Jackie Chan's birthday, or who he is married to, so on and so forth. So why don't we ask the uh, search engine to voluntarily feature those information on the site uh, without prompting. And so these are an example or refinement, uh, so progressive suggestion. And a lot of times, uh, even though we know you are searching for this Jackie Chan, we see the search log, uh, people are actually wanting to know related people on the site, so we can also make, make the digressive suggestions. So these are some examples that are already that apply the dialogue uh, concept in the uh, research community uh, in action in today's search engine. 
So, of course, uh, in dialogue, uh, we, it's all, a lot of times you have to remember the context. So this is a, another uh, example that uh, happens all the time. Uh, Tom Cruise, who is Tom Cruise's wife, immediately, um, the search engine will correct you. No, 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 that's not a right question. The right question should be, who were Tom Cruise's wives? <laughs> and so, probably, we actually tell you these are the example. And by the way, do you know, uh, he's the one that have all wives that are all taller than him. Uh, <laughs> and we actually can tell you. So you can actually ask the question, really? So tell me how tall is Katie? So in isolation, Katie is highly ambiguous. There are tons of a Katie out there. But in context, this is not actually ambiguous at all. And so we should actually train the search engine to understand the context. So here, right there, see, Tom, Katie is five feet, not five feet nine two inches taller than Tom Cruise, right? And in addition, you can actually also ask questions, where was she born? Gosh, she, what does she mean? Uh, in isolation, again, this is very ambiguous, but in context, this is very actually clear. Uh, so she here must be Katie Holmes, not Nicole Kingman and others. Uh, and of course, uh, this is being a interp interpretation, we would like to confirm that Nicole, uh, Katie Holmes uh, is actually the, uh, the subject we're talking about, and the answer is Toledo. Again, all these progressive suggestions and, uh, and everything is there. So we, we are not designing uh, this uh, dialogue for, for the text users. This interface is actually designed for naturally, speak, uh, naturally spoken uh, inter interface on your phone or something, but it's actually kind of fun to do the demo on the desktop as well. So this is actually uh, the, uh, the example of dialogue, carrying the, his, uh, the, the context, and carrying the history. And if you sign in uh, with the search engine, we actually uh, remember what you have searched about, uh, and it carries with you as a user through any uh, other properties of Microsoft. So uh, another example for disambiguation dialogue uh, to demonstrate the machine actually knows more. Uh, than human is, for example, Secret Garden. Uh, do you know Secret Garden actually have this many sense of interpretation? It can be actually a book, it's a band, uh, it's a TV show, a Korean drama, and it's actually a film, so on and so forth. Uh, so if you typically search for, uh, in the traditional 10 blue links, you will see all this interpretation intermingle in the search results, and it's actually a, a, a chore to actually uh, sort through them. Uh, here, what we're trying to do is to uh, list it out, and then if you follow the suggestion, we will clean up the, uh, the 10 blue links uh, to give you a more focused uh, content that you are looking for. And it, you don't have to come to the search result page uh, to do this. The disambiguation uh, activity is actually, actually starts at the middle of your typing. The, uh, so before you finish typing, Secret Garden, we say, you're probably trying to type Secret Garden, but and by the way, they are actually, these are the top two uh, possible interpretations for you, uh, so uh, to help you to formulate a query better. All right, so, um, so we, we, we develop all these technologies and our, being, our marketers in Bing tell us, oh, people like to use this for search, entertainment news, and celebrity gossip. And as a researcher, that is not actually quite fulfilling to us. So start a year ago, we actually volunteered to say, can we actually apply the same technology to do something that is actually more useful to us as a researcher? So last year, uh, we actually uh, announced that we started doing this work by applying the same artificial intelligence technology in search engine in the academic domain. Uh, so here is some example already live on the, on the site. Uh, you're welcome to try it. So as a researcher, I have a lot of uh, interns. Uh, they will come to me, and the first they will say, okay, I'm interested in learning machine learning. learning. Where should I start? And I, I as a mentor, typically will tell them uh, what to do. And actually, we train our uh, search engine to answer this kind of question. So if you type machine learning before you finish typing, we'll say, are you trying to ask this thing? If yes, click on that. And in addition to the uh, usual suspect, the temporal link on the site, now we actually clean it up uh, to 
give more academic information, scholarly information that includes uh, some brief description of what machine learning is, what the field is, where it sits in the ontology of the uh, computer science research area. And in the area of computer science, we actually are more uh, conference-centric than journal-centric. So we list out all the possible conferences that you, as a uh, research, uh, machine learning researchers, uh, that you probably want to follow. And of course, the famous author in the field. Uh, so to uh, rank these famous authors in the field, it's kind of risky because people say, hey, why did you rank this guy over me? So we are actually paying attention to a lot of work in this community, such as Edge Index or the Journal Impact Factors. Those are actually the technology we are also very interested in, and it's actually a bread and butter for search engine technology anyway. So let's go into the uh, uh, related people first. If you click on the Andrew Ang, so right there, we remember the context is machine learning, and we surface up all the machine learning uh, related uh, contents about this author. And one of the way we train our um, artificial intelligence to read is to also ask it to write. Uh, we be, just like uh, training our kids to, to uh, master a language, uh, you want the, the, the best way to see if they are reading correctly is to ask them to write. And then they can actually read what they write and compare it against what other people write and continue to refine their skill. So we also train the, uh, the system to try to summarize that what it has to learn. In this case, uh, we actually put something out there, and Joanne research primarily is machine learning and deep learning, so on and so forth. So, so you can actually go from there to follow uh, the user. What, uh, what, when I show to my kid about this, he said, oh really, there is a Michael Jordan here? And of course, he, the next thing he would do is click on Michael Jordan. Uh, in this case, this Michael Jordan happens to be a very famous person, researcher in this area. Uh, so, but we actually remember uh, in the dialogue, in the history, that the context coming to this query, now even though the query is Michael Jordan, but he has a rich context. It's under machine learning related to Andrew Wang. So here, uh, the, in addition to serving uh, up the information about Michael Jordan, you probably want to uh, show something about machine learning, Michael, Michael Jordan, and Andrew Wang. And in this case, if we just say, Michael Jordan and Andrew Wang are both machine learning researchers, that's kind of not infor informative. So we actually dig deeper and identify the most famous work is LDA, latent Dirichlet allocation. And that's exactly the advice that I, as a researcher, would actually give out uh, to, to the users. All right, so this is, uh, we are, this is an experimental feature, uh, feature in a way because the coverage right now is not that big, but rest assured we are working very hard to train our machine reader to read more uh, evidently and they can write more, uh, write better. So if you want to know more about Michael Jordan, uh, what other papers you, he, he has he has written, uh, you can actually ask the natural language library paper by Michael Jordan. And here again, before you finish typing, we are already listing all the possible Michael Jordan there, including some of them like Michael Scherter. Um, this, this author has never used his middle name in the writing, but some other sources we discover his middle name is actually Jordan. So uh, the fact that, that uh, he was Feature there is not a bug, which I already find a bug, and it's actually not. Uh, so, in addition to the Michael I. Jordan we talked about, we actually discover a lot of Michael B. Jordan, Michael R. Jordan. Poor people, <laughs> they probably cannot be discovered in a traditional search engine because the fa famous basketball star. But through this interface, we actually make them and their work more discoverable, hopefully. And so if you go in there, we also change the traditional uh, temple links uh, experience. We actually ask our machine intelligence to summarize the paper they have been reading. Uh, and these are the examples. So we are actually ask, we are asking the machine to give us what a summary. And Anurag also alluded to yesterday that as a researcher, what I, I wanted to know uh, about the papers I never, read, I never read is I want to know where it is published uh, who wrote them, uh, what institution sponsored the, uh, the research work, and what are the other key concepts in the papers. 
And so we actually train the machine reader to summarize those uh, in the uh, traditional uh, caption. Um, here's a more example about uh, the, uh, uh, the, the about the summarization. And you can tell that we are not perfect yet. So some of the results, we read them. Uh, this one happens to be an archive. It's a preprint where uh, our machine reader is not quite confident that how, how to make a conclusion yet. So we don't have that. But others, when it is a editorial quality published in the, in the journal, we try to do this as well. So other, speaking of other concepts, there is some, something called graphical model. If you follow the graphic model, this is experience, you will see uh, in a, on the right hand side, again, it's a summary, it's a bird's eye view of what mach our machine thinks that you should know about graphical model in all the uh, scholarly publications. Again, uh, this, is com this is a computer science area which is more conference centric, so we list all the conferences. Uh, but on the side, these are actually very famous graphical model. Um, and um, here I, I'm trying to show on the right hand side, uh, the, uh, we also list what people are so also search for. Uh, basically is related to a field of st fields in this one uh, that you, you, can, you can pursue. So this is something that I as a grad student wish I would have uh, in, doing, uh, in doing research. So let me switch gears a little bit to a, a features uh, that has not been fully deployed. Uh, we are actually conducting experiments on our live website. Uh, this is something we call interactive recommendation and insight uh, feature. Uh, that basically means that uh, as you're still typing, can we actually program uh, the search engine uh, to give you more in the insights that it has accumulated. Uh, and this is actually not a very easy task. Uh, it's a known uh, difficult task in the uh, AI community. Uh, you probably heard that Facebook is trying to do some similar feature called graph search. Uh, one of the things that, that has bugged the academic community uh, a lot is that how are these features, are, are these questions, and so how to recommend completions for something you haven't seen uh, uh, enough, and, or you haven't even seen before and how to rank these suggestions that we briefly talked about, and most importantly, how to avoid making suggestions that lead to the dead end. Uh, and that's actually uh, a known problem uh, because the uh, technology so, so far is at a context-free grammar level, uh, and we actually spend some time to actually take it forward uh, to develop a context-sensitive. That's actually another topic that I, I'd love to talk about to my uh, fellow NLP researchers, but this is the uh, this is the uh, the idea. So uh, one of the use cases uh, is like this: you can ask, ask about paper about maximum entropy, and who are actually the famous author. Uh, so as a reviewer, uh, typically I receive a paper. I want to f uh, I want to find other reviewers to read the papers. Uh, this is the thing that I would I would I would like like to have. Who should be uh, the Who should I send the paper to? Uh, for reviewing. And if many of them are actually, just like Anna Rotal said, a lot of these papers are actually uh, old, all the, pap all the papers. So a lot of authors probably are actually too busy to do the, uh, to do the review. So let's find the, uh, the most recent authors that are probably more interested in, in, the, uh, in reviewing the article. So you can actually start asking natural language-like sentence, uh, how about uh, for the past 10 years? And now so these authors are looking more promising. Similarly, you can ask a uh, venue. Uh, here, this is a, uh, in the KDD, Knowledge Discovery and Data Mining uh, area. And so papers in KDD, who, who are the famous authors uh, in, the, uh, in this conference? Uh, these are looking very good. You can also dive in into specific institution who, come, who are from Microsoft Research. They're actually avid uh, authors in KDD, so on and so forth. Uh, so this uh, is a, an example that uh, after we train the machine uh, to go through and aggregate all the information, suddenly it can be programmed to offer insights uh, immediately uh, to help us in getting a, uh, as a uh, editor of the magazine or coaching my uh, 
fellow uh, junior researchers who find good uh, collaborators, this is actually very, very useful, uh, at least for me. Uh, another one, uh, so if you want to search for someone you have never known before, um, typically you receive a resume. In, in this case, this is an analog. It's not, he probably doesn't need an introduction, but this is a, a use case. You want to know uh, who, where is NROG conducting research? It turns out that there are quite a few NROG, uh, University of Santa Barbara, and also another from University of Pennsylvania, really. Uh, so we can dive in, for, dive in further to say, well, uh, from University of Santa Barbara, what, what, what is this author, in which field that this author is conducting research? Oh, you can immediately see, yeah, okay, so this is probably a system researcher or in the uh, program, uh, PL, uh, program language area. And more, where does it publish? Yeah, it, it looks actually reasonable. And there, on the, on the fourth one, you can tell that, well, it's NROG is no, it's not only affiliated with the uh, Santa Barbara, but also the University of Maryland. And you can verify, yeah, it is true. He did a uh, postdoc at University of Maryland. Uh, in contrast, the other one from University of Pennsylvania uh, is doing, actually, it turns out to be a physicist. So this is result is also correct. Uh, it just happened. There are two of them. So this kind of tool is very helpful for, uh, for me uh, to actually uh, under research into the author that I don't know. Uh, typically in the, uh, um, in uh, receiving uh, reviews for grants or something after declining all the conflict of interests, you are left with people that you are really not quite familiar with. And this is actually what I would like uh, to know about them. Right, so let me, so what we have talked about right uh, up to at this point is the reactive search experience in which the user uh, is taking the dri driver's seat to formulate the intent and query. Uh, let me tell you about uh, the other side of the, uh, the, store, the uh, taken outlet where we're pushing our technology out. And that's in the uh, Cortana, that's the personal assistant or the intelligent agent in the original uh, semantic web vision. Uh, there, uh, what we have done is the proactive suggestion experience. Uh, so one of the uh, uh, most notable features, features for Windows 10 is the uh, Cortana uh, intelligent agent is actually on your desktop, not no longer just on your, on your phone. Uh, next to the start button, who was uh, missing uh, in Windows 8. Now it's back, and it's back with a vengeance. Uh, we actually bring the uh, personal assistant too. Uh, so if you click on the, uh, the, the Cortana without typing anything, it's actually trying to uh, predict what you want uh, based on the, uh, what we observe you as a user. So you probably heard about Windows 10 launch. People are actually having privacy concerns by letting Microsoft uh, monitor their behavior. Those features can be turned off, but in case you didn't turn off, this is the experience you will see. Uh, we will, um, you, you click on that, it will alert you about your local weather, your local news, and one of the things uh, that it does, it does the business is when we did, our Cortana team, when they designed the, designed the feature, they actually interviewed a lot of a personal assistants in real life uh, serving Hollywood uh, stars or serving uh, VIPs. Uh, and what, uh, one of the uh, design uh, outcome of that is all this successful personal assistant actually keep, keep a notebook about uh, the, the person they serve. Uh, they actually write, write down what uh, various aspects, uh, the, uh, the interest of the, uh, the people they serve. And so we actually have that feature and it, we put the control back to the users. So you can configure our, this personal assistant to tell you these are the areas you, I want you to monitor me and these are the other areas, uh, please keep me, pri uh, keep, uh, please respect my privacy. So we introduce an area, academic. It's right there alphabetically on top, an academic. Uh, and this is actually my, pro if you click on it, this is what Cortana actually knows about me. It correctly understands that I'm doing machine learning, artificial intelligence, so on and so forth. And there's a lot of switch, switches you can turn on and turn off. And as you uh, conduct your business doing web search engine or reading articles, it's 
uh, the Cortana is going to make more uh, inferences and suggestion things that you probably want to interest. So one of the example uh, is once you have this turn on, you scroll down uh, the alerting pane, uh, and this is what you see. So I have basically we trained the Cortana to go out and read all the articles on the web, and regardless which journals uh, it actually discovered, as long as it's in the field study of my interest, it will show me uh, the latest article and latest news, and in many, in many, uh, uh, for many areas, it also alert me the uh, events that I'm interested in. And so for the past uh, several months, I have been delighted to, to know that in my uh, area, NLP, there are quite a few publications from medical journals. Uh, they are applying uh, medical, uh, natural language processing te technology thanks to the, uh, uh, the Obama mandate that all the diagnostic, uh, diagnosis and health data have to be put online. And with this reach of the corpus make, putting online, suddenly the doctors. Uh, so those NLP articles are actually written by medical doctors, not computer scientists. And their approaches are actually uh, very interesting. We think we NLP people think we can have a lot to contribute. And so uh, it's actually a great find. Uh, that, those are the journals uh, typically I wouldn't have read. Uh, but thanks to the, uh, this machine, they reading the whole web, making alert to me it actually helped me quite dramatically. So one of the button, you can see more updates. If you go see more updates, uh, you see a whole shebang. And right now the experience is as such that we actually uh, d direct the user to the publisher. And so one of the pain points I have is, oh, I'm hitting a paywall uh, on my mobile phone. I'm not conducting this research on my corporate network uh, in which I would actually go over the paywall. So here, please help us um, that, to make this experience better. And so in addition to the, uh, the, the serious paper journal, we also uh, show uh, the, uh, the news articles, things like uh, Baidu is doing Siri compete, that kind of thing. They are actually, they are not scholarly, but they are also interested to me uh, as a practitioner, practitioners in the, in the field. All right, so let me uh, tell you where we are going with this. Uh, so um, Microsoft, um, over the history of Microsoft, we have a, a many uh, uh, company visions. Our recent vision is to empowering Every, every person and every business to, do, to achieve more. So you know that we were founded by computer, computers on every desk. We achieved that vision now, and now here is actually our uh, corporate strip, uh, co vision to empowering every person and every business, not just Microsoft, every, every business, including every one of you. And our business, businesses are aligned in these three pillars. Uh, Reimagine product productivity, more personal computing, and most intelligent cloud. Uh, these are the three areas we actually want to make money, uh, create a business cases for, and that's where we want to partner with you. And so in the uh, academic area, you probably have seen that I talked about academic search. How do we help researchers and students, faculty, uh, to be more productive uh, in, discovery, in discovery or in finding out uh, the materials? Uh, more personal computing, uh, we actually feel that we want to uh, do more on the personalization and user profile. And so the, one, the first step we took uh, is actually integrating the academic feature in the, our personal assistant called Cortana. Uh, it will be available on your phone. Uh, it will, it, it will company, accompany you 24 hours, 7, 24 seven. And so the rest of the talk, I would like to talk more. What we haven't talked more about is the most intelligent cloud. Uh, and this is a relatively new effort in the sense that we have all these technologies. Uh, in addition to making our own showcase pro product or demo product, we actually want to open up this technology as API to everyone. They want to build uh, innovative products on top of it. And you can tell that we are calling it a, by code name, which means our marketing people haven't figured out how to sell it. And so right now it's uh, called Project Oxford. 
Uh, Project Archiver was announced and in our, our developers conference back in April. Uh, as I mentioned, it's based a bunch of uh, artifi artificial intelligent APIs uh, that Microsoft Research have invested for years. And now we are actually ready to open it up uh, for the entire community uh, to utilize. Uh, for uh, April release, it has uh, several areas in the computer vision, uh, in the special area of computer vision called face API, and speech recognition, and in the language understanding. So in the uh, computer vision, we have um, uh, analyzed image. We can tell you this image is actually take, it's a landscape or it's actually a portrait uh, as well. As, uh, it, if it is a uh, landscape, where is, is a beach or is a mountain, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, another area is OCR and the uh, great uh, uh, thumbnail generation. It's, it's a uh, visual version of a text summarization. You're given a photo, tell me what's in the photo. In, uh, actually give a, a, a most represented part of the photo. Um, that's the thumb, thumbnail. Uh, for the face, face detection, uh, back in April, you probably got bombarded by your uh, social network about a photo and then there's how old uh, the, uh, the machine thinks your age is. Um, and that's actually thus. So a lot of ladies are very happy that they are actually 10 years younger uh, by the machine. Uh, and we miss uh, Master Yoda by 600 years, I think. <laughs> <laughs> But this is actually part of the API. Uh, so face uh, detection, face uh, grouping, and face identification. On the speech part, of course, uh, the Cortana is, you can actually, is an agent you can talk to. So we're opening up the API in, 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 the, sense, in the areas like speech recognition, uh, text-to-speech synthesis, and speech intent recognition. On the uh, language understanding part, this is just a beginning. Uh, it's just a start. We're going to have more uh, in coming in November uh, time frame. So more text. And you've probably already seen a lot of uh, intelligent technology based on uh, the features I showed today. Uh, these are actually just a few of them. Uh, the large scale language model that we all need uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, make the, uh, the uh, machine reading more successfully, to all the way to the personalization, user profiling, and the dialogue management. Uh, so these are all the things we can actually package up and making available to users. And we are in the active uh, discussion with potential customers. Of course, uh, the way we are rolling it out is based on demands. So the more demands we hear, the higher prioritization we will assign uh, to the features and make it out. And so we hope that, that we can actually talk to all of you to see what you will um, to see what, what you like. So in addition to the API, we are also making, uh, in addition to the technology, we are also making data uh, available to the community. And uh, one of the uh, earliest uh, releases is actually the, the, uh, the academic graph that we have, uh, we have harvested. And so it's already available on our cloud computing platform, Azure. Please uh, go and take a look. And you can download it. Uh, we have received a lot of complaints that downloading uh, this gigantic data set over the internet uh, is not the most reliable way of getting the data. And that's actually not, my, not our intention either. Our intention is why don't, uh, to encourage you to develop solutions on top of a cloud computing platform instead of downloading this gigantic data set over the internet. And for students or educators, we actually have a free, we actually offer free access to our cloud computing. These are the programs. They are hard to find, but we actually uh, put, we, we actually do the summarization on the, on the web, web page, so it's easier for you to find. For the research uh, purposes for big corporation or uh, beyond startup, I think we do have a Azure for research grant. Uh, we encourage you to take a look and apply for the grants. Um, so that's the uh, URL uh, for getting more information. So uh, this is all I have to say. And if we, as I said, we actually are looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, this is actually email address, orca at microsoft.com. If you have more uh, feedback or questions, feel free uh, to send it 
our way. And with that, I thank you for your attention. So I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Stephen Pinfield from the University of Sheffield. Thank you very Thank much you. for your presentation, really interesting. I want to ask you a question that you've probably been asked lots of times before, but I'd be very interested in your response, and that is that basically any system that is personalized um, and is helpful to me is inevitably collecting more and more data about me, um, and is storing that often, and is, that data is possibly being reused for other purposes. So my question is, what are the kind of governance systems that you have in place to work out where you draw the line here? Um, often research goes ahead of those governance discussions, <laughs> and it, it's just interesting to know how you deal with that. Right. Uh, so believe it or not, when we start doing the Bing, uh, the entertainment, uh, the, the entity experience, we actually not only do it on celebrities, we also do it on professionals and on LinkedIn and Gosh, we, how, I can tell you how, how many takedown notices we have received. So yes, we are actually very aware, we are actually aware uh, and we pay a lot of attention to the privacy issue uh, that, um, that are very important um, to, our, to, to our business. So um, we take the uh, privacy issues very, very seriously. Um, and, one of se several, actually, in, in, in several of these services, we are considering of exposing the most uh, difficult part is actually personalization and profile one. Those are not just the technology issue, they are also have a society, society and legal impact. And so that's the area that we have to work closely uh, with, the, uh, with our legal department uh, to find out and uh, to find out what are the best solutions. And inside of Microsoft, starting with Bing, uh, we actually have a, a task force to safeguard uh, the, 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 the so we so-called PII, personal identifying information, uh, under all sorts of jurisdictions. You know that European laws are different from US and which are also different from uh, many Asian countries. Uh, so we actually involve a lot of uh, legal experts uh, in the design, pro in the design uh, process. And, 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 and in addition to the personal space, there are actually quite a, uh, a lot of uh, um, consumer protection. In the, Microsoft also have a sizable business in the enterprise, uh, enterprise domains where the legal compliances, uh, all sorts of regulations and rules have to be taken into account. Uh, so this is actually not just an exercise for research. This is actually, I, I want to assure you that this is actually a intense collaboration between R&D department with the legal and geopolitical sensitive and all sorts of other uh, areas that uh, we have to take, we, we are taking very seriously. And so the first day you come to uh, my organization, for example, you have to undergo, you have to undergo several uh, trainings, uh, the uh, legal training, security training, and privacy training. And you are, it's, it's actually uh, quite a chore, a uh, four day training uh, that you have to go through. Uh, so it's, again, it's not just the uh, uh, technology issue and we actually want to uh, educate our researchers not to get ahead of what is actually possible, uh, what is permissible. Thank you, thank you for the question. Thanks. I'm John Lees Miller from Overleaf. Um, I was just wondering about how people discover all of these amazing features that Bing now does. Because actually, I use <laughs> Bing fairly frequently, and I had no idea that it did <laughs> most of that stuff. Yes, we are trying to help. Uh, we are trying to work with our marketing department to make the uh, uh, the feature uh, more discoverable and raise uh, awareness. Um, so. 
typically uh, in, in, in search engine, we actually work with the, uh, uh, the, the trade organizers. So one of the uh, news release I put up there is actually search engine, uh, search engine land. Uh, that's a uh, influ influential publication blog by a famous blogger. We, particip particip we participated actively in the uh, related trade, uh, trade shows. Um, and we try to uh, uh, make it more uh, um, accessible and uh, more understandable to, uh, to end users. And that's why I'm here today, partly. Hopefully, I raise the awareness of every one of you uh, to, uh, to these features. Um, but I'm, I'm not a marketing guy. I, I'm working closely with them now. Um, Marjorie Lava, Access Innovations. You talked about um, semantic web and the knowledge web, and I think I know what web means, and I think I know what semantic means, but I wonder if you could define knowledge in your context. Ah, that's actually a very hard question in the uh, AI community, and if you buy an AI textbook, there are actually quite, there are at least two chapters developing what knowledge means. Uh, in terms of knowledge representation, common sense knowledge, um, we try to uh, um, avoid uh, the uh, academic debates on what knowledge is. What knowledge mean, means here is the, 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 the collection of tip fact, factoids or inf, uh, the, uh, the rules or uh, all the things that the, can make the machine more intelligent to you, to, to the users. And they are the information, uh, organized information that can help uh, the users or machine to take to infer what are the right actions and how to actually interact with users. So it's kind of abstract, but that's actually uh, the, the state of art definition, if you want, in the AI industry, in the AI community. Um, did I understand your question correctly? <laughs> yeah, it's, it can be a little bit philosophical, uh, but for uh, engineering, we just say, well, that's the, uh, in, in the uh, industry, we, uh, you know, Google has entity graph. Microsoft has something we call Satori. It's basically a collection of facts, relationships, and entities, and how they interact with each other over uh, different contexts. That's what we meant by knowledge. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Simon Kerry from the University of Kent. Um, fantastic presentation, really enjoyed it, um, thought-provoking. And I really like the idea of not trying to define things so that machines can understand them, but allow data to be what it is, that humans can understand and have machines learn that. Um, I really like the way in which the workflows seem to work, in, which, in the way in which researchers want them to work. Um, one area I'm interested in uh, what to ask about is uh, you can find publications. What about research data or data sets? Has there been any work done in that area? Right. Uh, that's actually the uh, next frontier uh, we, we, want, we want to go. So right now, we are, you, you can see we are actually helping users to discover papers, uh, news, and articles. And the next one is actually really the data. And especially in my areas, is data is usually not enough. We actually have to dump a lot of data. And even though you read the papers, you try to replicate them, uh, there are a lot of details that you probably don't write into the paper. So how do you best uh, to actually replicate the experiments? So how about, uh, so in my research, we, in my research areas, people start actually putting out their uh, algorithm with data uh, as web service. Uh, that's actually uh, in many areas, especially if the data set is big or your algorithm requires cloud computing, that's probably the only realistic way uh, to actually promote re the uh, replication of the, uh, the research. So that's actually, and fortunately right now, the cloud computing infrastructure is coming to a uh, stage that uh, 
doing this at a scale is actually possible. So um, the next thing we would like to do is actually being to actually understand data and the data in, in the context. Again, these data sets is associated with this you know, uh, article. We link them together. Um, and if this, this article has actually like a web service published for to uh, describe the algorithms, we also want to link them together as part of our uh, entity graph and then make it uh, discoverable at, uh, for the user. Yes, thank you. And then the, uh, the next thing, uh, additional thing is we also received requests on grants. Uh, the grants proposal, we help the uh, uh, faculty members to find uh, grant opportunity and copy uh, that kind of information, we hope they, uh, and some of the, uh, v uh, I didn't show you, some of them, uh, some of the field of study, we start putting online courses to help students. So um, they are quite a, it's a, yeah, it, it's a yeah, open uh, area for us. Um, again, we'd like to hear uh, the industry feedback and what to determine where we go next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.